Our sponsor this week is Kim Lyon, owner of Pliny's Fitness Studio in Rain Hill. She is an ex-international British gymnast who represented her country all over Europe from the age of 6 to 18. She is now an online coach who is training people for £1 per day. Her next starting date is Monday the 3rd of May. For 28 days, only £28. Please give her a follow on her Instagram. Thank you. Hello everybody, welcome to the Billy Moore podcast and today's special guest is the Governor's daughter, Kelly McLean. How are you, Kelly? Not too bad actually today, sun shining. Thank you, lovely part of the country. Uh, so, let's start from the beginning. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, well, I was brought up in the East End in the 70s and the 80s. Obviously, my dad was Lenny McLean, the Governor. Um, we had a reputation to stand up to, I suppose, me and my brother, having a dad like that. Uh, other than that, just a general normal upbringing, I suppose. Yeah, so bring, going, going up, growing up here with a notorious, you know, man as a father, how was that going forward? Um, well, I suppose I had my problems, but obviously one of them stemmed from like when I was younger and I didn't tell anyone. Uh, yeah, I suppose all the kids feared us, you know, but we had, mm. we built up our own reputation, you know, we wasn't bullies, you know, we, we never went out there and caused trouble, we had loads of friends, but obviously, like, indoors, I think it was a normal life, but I mm. suppose a normal person looking on at us, I suppose it wasn't, really. What were the problems that you had growing up that you, you felt you couldn't talk about? Um, well... My head always used to go, like, I used to go off on one, and mm. I just thought, obviously, I was just born like my dad. But I didn't realise, when I got to 40, um, I was assessed by the mental health for two years, and I was diagnosed with cyclopnia, mm. which is a mild form of bipolar. Also, in my book, I don't want to declare too much, but um, I was abused by ch um, as a child by an outsider. Mm. And Obviously, I never spoke about that, but since writing my book, it's very therapeutic, and... I can speak out openly about it now. So that's that's probably been really traumatic. Well, yeah, I had a lot of issues growing mm. up. I had like anorexia. There's other stuff that I'd done that was in the book, like self-arming. And I just mm. put it all down to losing my mum and dad. But in reality, it's your makeup, isn't it? So I suppose when I was younger, all the stuff that's happened... And and I suppose it, when, in a later age, I just it started coming out that way. It's mad, isn't it? Because like you know, would you have such a um, you, you know a dad with a massive reputation, you know, and you've been you know abused by someone outside the family? Did you ever think you could ever share that with your your mum or your dad? And no, it was it was, it was a different kind of abuse. It mm. was um it was by a woman. So because mm. obviously when I first told my husband, because I had a lot of problems and um my husband couldn't cope. And when I told him I was abused, he didn't really believe me because he thought, who would abuse Lenny McLean's daughter? But then when we, I actually wrote the book and confessed that it was a woman, then he could obviously see the other side of it. But no, I think if I would have told my dad, there never would have been a Lenny McLean. He would have just been a normal bloke doing time in prison because he would have just murdered the whole family. You mm. know, So he would never have fought Roy Shaw, never would have been the governor. Mm. So in one way, I suppose I've kept a secret. It was hard for me, but then I'll give my dad that choice. Really, does he go that way or that way? And you know, see, yeah, uh, you, you know, you're like some, you know, people put expectations on the abusers, and you know, it's, it's to be men, or you know, you never to be thought of as a woman. Exactly. You know yeah. what I mean? So you can, yeah, you can understand the doubt in some people, but it's 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 your truth, and it is what it is. Yeah. You know, so you know, how was life growing up? How did you feel? You know, uh, did you ever did you ever feel as if um like embarrassed or ashamed or, or proud or what was the feelings that you were going through? Oh, always proud. I mean, yeah. we, you know, we had the best of everything. Yeah. It wasn't spoiled. Well, <laughs> I don't know what spoiled is, but, you know. Tell we, me what you think spoiled. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've never, I've only just started recently buying my own cars. My dad's bought my car every three years. I've never ever done an MOT. Yeah. You know, why I was alive. But, I never just took stuff off of him. You know, he would offer it to me mm. and I'd say, no, I don't want it. I'm not going out, you know. But growing up, we did have, we had everything, you know, and I was never, ever embarrassed at all, mm. you know. It was like, it, 
I suppose back then in the 80s, it was like God, wasn't it? Everyone mm. go, oh, look, your dad's come in and everything, you know, and anyone started on us, oh, quick, go and get your dad. So it's just all my friends, it was God. It's so. amazing, yeah, because, you, you know, there's, yeah, see, I'm, I'm sharing, like, like, from my own experience. I had a different upbringing. And my dad was quite uh, volatile, but he was drinking a lot. And I kind of I felt a little bit embarrassed, a little bit ashamed. You know, yeah. I, I, I love to have shared, I, I was proud of him. So it's good to hear from yourself that you, you felt that way. Yeah. I mean, it was, don't get me wrong, he was a drinker at yeah. the beginning. And obviously, in his book as well, he declares that he, um, he stopped drinking at the age of 28. And in my book also, I say the reason why he stopped drinking. And then life did become better. Don't get me wrong, we did live on eggshells when he mm. didn't drink. You know, we had yeah. two flights of stairs to our flats. So as he come up one, we'd run down the other with me mum, me and mm. Jamie in the car and we'd go for a few hours until we yeah. sobered up. That's what we were like. You know but he never, mean? ever, ever laid an hand on us. Yeah. But he didn't need to. Yeah. I'd probably just crush you. <laughs> if he did, I like. think probably I would have probably preferred a backhand out yeah. because his face was more scarier than anything. Yeah. And he used to double in size if he used to go into one. Like a cobra. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's just, it, yeah. Just like to spread. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. My, my, my dad was like, it's definitely, it, it, like, had the same experience. Like, when he came in, we were walking on eggshells. Yeah. You know, my mum would say, she had six of us, so she'd have to walk the streets with, with uh, half a dozen of us and pushing a little pram. And, you know, and that was until he calmed down. You yeah. know, but it's so it's like it's different kind of experiences. I think but in, in, sorry, I think in the eighties and mm. the seventies, the seventies and eighties, I think most men were like that. I'm yeah. not making excuses no, for them, no. but it's just different generation now. I mean, my kids, I mean, we're quite open. You know, I'll tell them stuff, and we just my husband says, "Oh, you shouldn't tell them that." I said, "No, I tell, tell them everything. I'm not going to hide nothing." Yeah. They know exactly as well that I had a bad start in life. They don't know that much, mm. but I've not hid that I had a bad start from an outsider. Yeah, because we're both the same age. I was born in 73. I'm pretty sure you're around the same. Oh, listen, I'm 21. I don't know where you got that from. <laughs> Someone's giving you some wrong information, I think. <laughs> so, so, so I can, you know, I can identify with um, what it was like growing up in the 80s and it was a different era. Yeah. You know, it was like a Victorian dad. He came yeah. in when he wanted your mum had to cook the tea and have it on the yeah, table. So. And, it was nice yeah. though. I mean, we were never we were never in as kids, was we? Yeah. You know, yeah. I mean, my we, kids don't move outside the door. No, see, I was um, I was always out. I was out like like egging or you yeah. know, for, for anyone who knows who doesn't know what egging is, we were, used to go looking for birds birds eggs. Oh, you know, right. you know, I've got a different way of uh, making. We used to egg um, people's parents uh, <laughs> over the balcony with eggs. So, yeah, so, <laughs> you know, I, I just think like growing up was, was was a lot better than it is today. There's too much temptation for these kids yeah. today. And it's sad. You know, there's no there's no way uh, interaction, there's no way uh, in communication. Everything's social media. You know, you've yeah. got to be a social media wonder or a social media star and um, it's 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 quite sad. And I like the um, I liked like Going out and spend because we used to go out and spend all day. Yeah, didn't want to be in the house. No, you know what I mean. Come home, have a jam butty or a sauce butty, then off again. You know what I mean? It's it, you know, kind of miss those days. I mean, at school, I look after. Um, I'm manager of the half school club, so I've got like 28 children I look after, and I, I play things like bulldog. They go, what's that? Tin Tan Tommy. They haven't heard all these games. You no. know, it's because they're sitting there behind an iPad, or. Um, PlayStation, it's a shame. I just think generation is just completely different to what it was. Yeah, definitely. You I know. try and keep my house back to basics, though. Like, we will do a nice holiday, but we'll also do a camping holiday where there's nothing there. Mm. And we do eat around this table five days out of seven as a family. Yeah, that's nice. You know, I try and, and no iPads, no phones, nothing. So, all traditional values you yeah. bring them back in. And that's, um, yeah, that's important. I, I feel a shame. I've got a little boy now and, um, I worry about his future, you know, because it's not going to be the same as what it was for me. Of course it ain't, no. You know, people are wrapped up in phones, you know, and I, I, I see it when I go home, you know, me little girl on the phone, you know, she's constantly on it. And it, it is what it is. It's it's, yeah. it's the way of I life. I don't know if I've seen a picture of it, boy. He looks like you, doesn't he? I is believe he, he, he can either look like his mum or he can look like me yeah. on the best of days. <laughs> I think he looks like me when he's crying. Oh yeah, yeah that, that might be it then. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, I, was, I suppose with me going back to the old values, it's because of my mum and dad was like that. I mean, no matter what people want to think of my dad, he still was a dad indoors. Like Christmas, he put a hat on, Christmas hat on, never fit. So just put it straight across, always split. 
you know, but he, he play things like hide and seek with you. And I don't think people realise that. That's that's why I opened the Facebook page. Mm. Um, can I just say, by the way, it is the official Lenny McLean site um, run by Lenny McLean's only daughter, me. And we have got over 23,000 people following us. Now, and I just, can I just say one more thing, sorry? You see what... Um, thank you to Tony Turner and Karen Latimer for helping keep my dad's memory alive on the site. So, sorry. And yeah, big, big thank you to Tony from myself, really, for, for getting us in touch and having the opportunity to sit down now and, and do this podcast. So, yeah, yeah thanks, Tony. Um, and once again, um, it's really lovely to be here. It really is, you know what I mean? I'm, I'm quite excited to hear more about what it was like uh, for yourself. I know we talk, we don't, it's not about your dad, yeah. you know, the podcast, it's not, you know, we could, we could easily sit here and make it about your dad, but it's yeah. not, he's part of your life, he's, he's obviously part of your journey, yeah. but you've also had your journey in life and your struggles and your, your, the joys as well. Well, this, can, sorry, can I borrow that book? Sorry. You can, please do, yeah. I've got um, Billy a book. So in this book, what what it was, I didn't want to bring this book out and I didn't want it, people to think, oh, I didn't want to get recognised for being Lenny McLean's daughter. Yeah. I want to be recognised for my story. And I do cover a lot of mental health issues in the book also. Mm. And like I've said before, that I was diagnosed with cyclophnia. But since writing the book, I have got full-blown bipolar now. Yeah. And I struggle every day with that. You know, people don't understand, I don't sleep. You know, I, I hear things differently. And I think this is... What happened to my dad as well, in, in, like in his 20s, I think, because he was so aggressive, is because he heard something different to what you would hear it. Where we've got a chemical imbalance of the brain, we hear it like you're, you're challenging us. Mm. You know, we hear it in an aggressive way. In conflict mode all the yeah. time. Yeah. And I straight away, I, I flare up and I go back. I still make mistakes now. I'm 49 coming up this year, mm. and I still make mistakes now, even up until the other week. I answered someone back when really I should have sat back, counted to 10 and thought about it. You know, because that's exactly what they wanted me to do was react and that's mm. what I did. So I still make mistakes now. I just wish my dad was still here and he had the opportunity to get help like me. You know, I'm on certain tablets for my bipolar and mm. they do help a little, but you have to work at it yourself, not just rely on tablets. Yeah, yeah, no, I agree. I mean, it's like, it's, I probably had the same a chemical imbalance myself. I've never took medication, but I have sort of sedated myself yeah. with drugs over the years. So it's, uh, it's 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 either that or, or nothing for me at the yeah. time. Now it's it's not. But yeah, I've had that same situations where I've reacted and not took that breath yeah. and separated the men from the boys and went, you know what? I don't need to there give my power away here because yeah. I can do that. Yeah, because you'll yeah. always get people in life that thrive on negativity. Oh, yeah. And I've got a few of them around me, and they and they, and they they push and push and push my buttons until mm. I, I blow. And and my husband said, just don't react. Just, mm. you know, just leave it. Most of the time, I listen. Mm. Every now and then, I don't. And and the only person it winds up is me inside. Do you think you take after your dad in them ways, in a sense? Was, you, was your dad, like, really, like... He, he, Straight away, you'd, you'd yeah, react. you couldn't. Yeah, there's certain things you couldn't say, but you got to know what yeah. it was. Um, even down to eating something, if you want, you want the soul, you could never go across. You had to get out of your chair and go round the other side of him. It just go right into one case. Something's fell on his dinner. Yeah, you know, it just it, it it's hard to explain. Like I come off of my mood stabilizers a few times to try. Don't get me wrong. First couple of weeks, it's lovely. I'm bouncing off every wall. I like that. I mm. like the high feeling that I can get everything done, my ass work, run, train, and not feel tired. Yeah. But then after a little while, my mind starts playing tricks with me, and I start getting possessed with something, you know, constantly doing something. Control. Yeah. yeah. And it's other people, like my husband can't handle it. He says, I know you're off your mood stabilizers. He said, you're too aggressive. Yeah. And I answer quick. You know, so, and then obviously my mind, I just don't know which way to go. So it is horrible to think that I have to be on these tablets for the rest of my life, but I've tried twice of trying to come off of, it, off of them and it does not work. So you've made that decision now just to... Um, yeah. Completely... I mean, I'm, I'm on psychotic ones of a night, but I've got to be honest, all they make me do is sleep and eat, so I've put about a stone on. I don't really like that because I'm, I like, I'm self-conscious of, like, obviously my body mm. and my training... 
So I'm going to start to come back off of the new night ones. I'm just going to have to try and work with a pattern to help me sleep, I suppose. Yeah, so you like training. Do you think training helps with your self-esteem and your confidence? And... Yeah, I, like, I love going out training. I'm a bit like my dad, though. I've got odds and sods. I don't, you know, like these girls who are out all the makeup on and <laughs> I'm not like that. I've got old odd socks and, and gym gear. My dad was the same because it's not about what you look like. It's about what performance you put into your training. Yeah. And, that, and he was exactly the same. You know, he loved he loved his fitness. You know, he'd go out for hours. I'm sure half the time he's probably somewhere else. <laughs> <laughs> Making out his training. Did you ever go training with your dad? Yeah, I used yeah. to go running with my dad. And he was going, I don't sprint off, just do my speed. I go, right, because he could run far, but he had a steady speed. And yeah. then right at the end, I'd sprint and leave him. You know, but the funny thing is, he'd do all that training, then he gets in the car and, and roll up a fag. It was mental. And I would say, I, I don't know if people can do that, you know. Yeah. I've um, I've been over in Thailand and I've been in the ring with Thai boxers. And before I've got in to fight them, I've observed them smoking cigarettes and drinking whiskey. And I'm thinking, these, 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 these have got a big engine, these Thais, you know what I mean? Yeah. And he can train and he can fight. And I don't smoke and I don't drink and, I think, and I'm getting beat. You know, it's uh, <laughs> so I was like, "What?" Perhaps you should have tried that. And I do, tra- and, I, and I trained really hard. It's it's it, they just transition from like kids to become lethal yeah. weapons. You know, and I, and your dad, he's he's probably had that like um, mature muscle over the years because he was a big, big man. Yeah. He you was know. naturally a big frame. Yeah. Like even if he didn't train, the width of him was wide. You know, and. The length. I mean, I've got quite long arms, and my dad has. Do you know what I mean? Mm. Like, I, I, I just our own sort of like physique mm. is naturally there anyway. So as soon as we start training, it don't take long for us to build up like a bulk. He was a heavyweight, weren't he? Really? So yeah. what was he fighting at? What weight? What? Uh, when he was younger, I, don't know, I suppose he was about seventeen, yeah. something like that. But um, seventeen stone. But when he got older, he was twenty-one stone of muscle. I'm sure that's big, isn't it? Yeah, he had to lose to unit, three like... stone for lock stock. Because yeah. he was too big. I think that's the first time I'd ever seen him on, 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 the, on the big screen. I think it was the first. Was it his first? Uh, uh, no, he did. He, he, he declared, he did Fifth Element and he yeah. didn't stop talking about it. Then all of a sudden he went quiet. He loved quiet. it, did he? Yeah. Yeah, he went a bit quiet. And then I thought, why is that? Then we watched the video, the film, never seen my dad. Never, my dad went, oh, they must have cut me out. <sighs> all right. Well, I went for it, didn't I? I went, found you. Mm. He had this um, um, policeman's outfit, but it was one in the future. Well, so well. this is a Bruce Willis? <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. It weren't a great scene with Dad, but that's why I didn't declare it after, but that was the actual first film. So Lenny was in the fifth element. That's it, yeah. I think he nicked Bruce Willis's changing room because it was bigger than he's. <laughs> it is. <laughs> I've got a friend here, T.K. Jake, Jake Abraham, um, who loves your alpha, loves your dad. He worked yeah. with your dad. Jake was the... Um, the Scouser, not the oh, one with the curly hair. The one with the straight. And uh, the stories. We 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 done a podcast, me and Jake, uh, last year, and he was talking about your dad and yeah. uh, how your dad really enjoyed his company. And and you, I could see that because he's a likable character. Uh, and yeah, you know, there's a lot of uh, positive. There's loads of. Yeah, I suppose there's positive and negative in anything, yeah. really, isn't he? Yeah, well, like with everyone, you've got good and bad in everyone. Yeah. You know? It's just if your good can shine over your bad, I suppose, you know, outweigh your bad, then, and, you know, that's better, isn't it, I suppose? And and like, like I said, he never had the tools. If he was here now, then perhaps I could have helped him and guided him into a better life. I mean, mm-hmm. he did, don't get me wrong, he did mellow down in his older age. Not that he was old, bloody hell, he was 49 yeah. when he died. You know, ages, yeah. No, same age I'm coming up to now, you know, but he, he definitely mellowed. You know, when people used to come round, some people used to come round and talk about fighting. But I don't think, they, he didn't want to talk about that. You know, he'd want to show him the dog, oh, he's not interested in that. He just wants to talk about normal things and funny things. You know, he did leave his work outside and, and family life completely different. Hmm. So he, he was good like that. He died of cancer, your dad, didn't he? Yeah. It's, it's sad, you know, and I, especially at 49, and I was, um, you know, I was diagnosed with cancer at 40. 45. What cancer did you I have? I had non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, which is a, a form of blood cancer. Right, okay. Which uh, affects the lymph nodes. And it was it was, um, it was, was a shock. I mean, any fatal kind of illness like that. So being, is it in remission? Or is yeah, it it's in the clear. So oh, it's been, good. well, that's over three years. And I, I, can, I believe your dad kept it quiet, didn't he? He didn't really... 
share it with many people. <laughs> well, you can say he wanted to wear a billboard really saying, I've got cancer. Mm. He was one of them. He liked to see the reaction. It was my mum. Mm. She said, don't tell anyone. Every time someone come in, he said, I'll be dead in six months. It was like he wanted to see the reaction on their face. He yeah. was mad. So my mum kept saying to him, keep it quiet. But he's, he's talking about his funeral every night. Yeah. Like, how big it would be? Would you reckon? My mum be sitting there sobbing. She'd say, wrong with him. But it was like as if he wanted to see how many people would turn up. What do you think they're going to say? About? I think he'd be shocked of the respect that he has got. I don't think he realised the impact he had on people. That that was possibly his coping mechanism. Yeah. You know, because I've, I've been in that situation where you just get total acceptance that you're gonna, your life's going to end and... You know, you you just talk about. Yeah. It's it becomes you it becomes normal to 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 communicate like that. Um, I mean, bless him. He was strong. You know. Yeah. I mean, he knew he was dying, and I got to give him his due every night. He was out walking about because the the Macmillan nurses says he will probably spend a few months in in bed. My mum said no, he won't. The day he can't get out of bed will be the day he dies because that's the kind of man he is. Yeah. And that was exactly right. The last night before he um, passed away, he got up and he wanted to walk all around the house, and we had very steep stairs. My mum said, "Len, you can't go down there." And he said, "Move out the way," because he had drop foot from the cancer. Mm. So my mum said, "If you fall, I won't be able to pick you up." But he wanted to look round in every room to see, I suppose, his house for the last time. And then the next morning he passed away. I think sometimes, you know, you know. Don't you? I mean, dad was like that. He passed away of cancer and it was nice to have been by his side. But at the yeah. same time, I mean, he was, I'd say he wasn't 49, he was 63, which is he's still quite young. Yeah, it's not. You know, you, you know you, this day and age, you know, people are living into the 80s, 90s, 90s. God, You yeah. know, so, you know, at 63, you know, to lose a father... To lose a family member, it's 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 sad, but you know we've got to carry on. Yeah. Um, I mean, I do, don't get me wrong. I do. I carry on, but I don't carry on well. Like people say, you learn to live with it. I I I've not. I've never. I'll never learn to live with it. Um, because yeah. I've lost my dad and sorry, and I've lost my mum ten years later. My mum got diagnosed with exactly the same cancer. It's, I just believe that you know your life's mapped out for you. Just like what's going on now with this um, coronavirus. I know my mate stresses about it. But the thing is, it is what it is. If it mm. wants to take you, it will take you. I believe in that. And that's just my motto. I'll just, I'll carry on living my life. I won't let it drag me down. Yeah, yeah. No, and I'm, I'm fully, uh, I'm on board with that. It's, um, I've always said, like, we're blessed with a few short decades. You know, it's about enjoying it. Yeah, we do have our struggles. Yeah. We do suffer with depression. We do suffer with anxiety. But there's also, you know, there's joys and gifts that we've got. Yeah. It's about uh, enjoying the moments. Well, exactly. You know? And I stress that to, to, to people. You know, people say to me, how did you get through, you know, the experience of uh, being in, in foreign countries, uh, banged up abroad? And I said, you know, you just got it. Yeah, you just get there is no blinkers on. You know, you just got it. It's, it's, it is what it is. You've got to just keep breathing, keep moving forward, you know, and believing in yourself. And sometimes... Uh, I've gave up, Kelly. You know, I've had that like um, that that moment where I thought that's it. I'm going to end it. Yeah. I have. I've, I'm going to end it, and um, it, it it'll be better. You know, that selfish way of thinking because yeah. we don't realise that we're not just you know because we're in pain. You know what happens then is that we're giving everyone else it because well, yeah, because it oozes at you. Yeah, it? It's, it's, if you're, you're st- depressed and down. I mean, if I'm down in this house, everyone it's like, else is. It's yeah. like a black cloud. You know, I don't know if I've got that presence, but it's just it's just overwhelming, and I won't have that anymore. I spent too long being depressed. We I had, live for the yeah. moment. We I had live, that. Sorry, I live every day like it's my last. Yeah. And I think that's the right way you should be. When I was young, I had savings here, this, that. Do you know what? When I got it, it can I spend it. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going for lunch. <laughs> <laughs> We're going down the West End with yeah. my card. With your card. <laughs> yeah, it's nice. Um, no, I, I yeah that that when you you know that negativity permeates. It's like you can walk into a room and the atmosphere is really dark. And yeah, I'm, I had that with my dad a lot. Yeah, see, my, shit there. yeah, my dad was like that. You yeah. could walk in a room and like you could hear a pin drop, you know. And I it, and I've got that exactly the same. Like Scott come in, he goes, he, he can tell that I'm depressed mm. because as soon as he walks through the door, it just hits him. Mm. Yeah, it is. Yeah. It's like it's, it's strange. It's like. See, like when my dad passed away as well, I've had a few strange experiences. When he passed away, the room went cold. 
and there was about thirty people in that room at the time when he was when he was when he was when he was, when he was passing on, uh, and everyone else felt it. Yeah. So there's something kind of like here, uh, something going on, and you can walk. It's like a wall. Yeah. You know, the whole, the whole atmosphere changes your demeanor, everything, oh, definitely. and it's yeah. like you know, remember that saying yeah. years ago: if if your dad's happy, you're happy. Yeah. You know, the people pleasing that yeah. we used to do, you know, he's happy, so he's happy, and if he's not with all like that, you know, that's no way no. To, to live, is it really? Well, that's and what I, I'm thinking here. Yeah. Like, if dad's happy, it's if mum's happy. Well, if mum's happy, yeah. <laughs> Either mum's or dad's, it, yeah. it, it doesn't... Um, the girl says to me, when you go, mummy, your eyes are scared. <laughs> I've got the same eyes as my dad. Yeah. You know, I don't obviously don't never lay a hand on my children, but same now and then I, I might scream at them about something. They said, your eyes go scary. Yeah. Well, I mean, I've tempted, I've tempted fate before. In my book, I tried to commit suicide. Like I said, I've got too much coming out. You need mm. to obviously get my book by uh, me, my dad, the governor. Um, and, you know, I won't tempt fate anymore. I didn't want to live, but I want to live now yeah. and I want to see a better life. Brilliant. And where can you buy this book? Um, you can get this on Amazon, eBay, anywhere it's worldwide, any bookstore, mm. WH Smiths. Um, well, I look forward to reading it, Michelle, to be honest. I, I know you don't want to really share too much, and I, I think there's the synopsis on the back will probably tell me a little bit about you. You know, and um, see, I always come, and you said to me, uh, this is this is the stage of, I never bring questions. I've never sat down with a guest and asked, you know, I had a question prepared. Um, yeah. I think it's better to come along and just be authentic. Yeah. Be a little bit awkward. A bit raw. Yeah. yeah. You know, when you said, what are you going to ask? What are you going it, to... It's, it's premeditating, like, what you're going to answer. So it, it, it kind of, like, it becomes scripted. And sometimes yeah, sometimes you just... You, you look like you're reading it, don't Yeah, you? and you've well. got to roll with it. You know, you've got to kind of... Uh, to me, I, how I feel an interview should be is, like, identifying maybe or... Yeah. Asking questions which can, can lead on to something else, you know. And this 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 book that you've got can lead on to a lot of things, really. But I know it's a uh, it's going to be one for those who want to buy it. Yeah, well, it's definitely a roller coaster of a story. I mean, I get inboxes daily, weekly, monthly, everything about this book. How fantastic it is how it's helped them through bad times, and that's what I wanted to achieve from it. Not. Um, be achieved because it's I'm Lenny McLean's daughter but like I said yeah. before for my story the mental health side of it and to make awareness to cyclophmia which I don't think it's got um enough awareness like bipolar I remember that John Blake I wrote to him once yeah. and he kind of felt my book initially wasn't for him well how wrong was he how uh, wrong was you John <laughs> <laughs> I got a letter back from him saying Ah, wish you all the best. It was a nice letter. Yeah. Wish you all the best. But unfortunately, you know, I've got a lot going on. It probably won't be for me that the day. Um, uh, so why don't you try some such a such and sorry, John? But it became a best seller. Moving on. <laughs> anyway, that's funny. You're back, isn't it? I always like that, you know, because I, I, Kel, I, I, I wrote him. Um, I wrote. I don't know. I, I wrote my book in the uh, ones where prison, the first one, and I was writing it that blood and fucking guts and everything was coming out, and it was like. Uh, yeah, who do we who do we um, get to publish it? And I wrote it the back. See, like I've got your book out of a prison library or something, and I was reading. I go, John Blake, okay, what's because you usually have the address in it. Yeah. So I'd write, put up a synopsis in, tell him, and I wrote it loads, loads and loads and loads, and got rejected like about 20, 30 times. And I thought, okay, don't give up, just carry on. Yeah. Eventually, someone took hold of it, and then it became what it became. So you know. I always stress that, you know, if you've got something and you believe in it, never yeah. never give up on it. No, this is you what know. I say to the children when they say, I can't do this. You can. There's no such word as you can't. Mm. You can do it. You can do anything you want to achieve in life if you push yourself. I know, but I think that we become like a condition, don't we, to say, oh, I should, I couldn't, I wouldn't, I yeah. can't. Don't get I me know. wrong. In the last three years, I've stood in front of that mirror and I've thought, right, see that? See that book? Put it in the back burner. I don't want to do it anymore. Don't want to run the site no more. Go in that corner, crumble and go into a depression. That's mm. exactly what I say to myself. And then I look back at the mirror and I say, no, come on, you're Lenny's daughter. Come on, you're tough. You can do this. And I've not give up. And look how far I've come. I've written a book. Um, 
Also, um, I've got 23,000 people following me. They're not following me because of my dad. They're actually following me now, which is good. I've made like a bit of a reputation for myself but in a nice way. And I've mm. made myself known on the media side of it. So, you know, and that's through not giving up. So anyone, if you've got anything that you want to do, please don't give up and carry on. Yeah, and you're also, in, advice I'll give. you're also involved in change your life, put down your knife. I mean, that's... <laughs> I'm so glad that's... you said that because I always get it the wrong way <laughs> right. <laughs> right, so I'm not sure if... I'll just stand up. So this is the campaign that I am... Um, involved with and i support um very strongly towards it as well like knife crime and obviously my dad hated weapons as well so yeah so there you go what was it again put down your <laughs> change your really life <laughs> change your life and put down your life That's we it. yeah I'm, in, I'm involved in something similar to liverpool it's called i'll probably get it wrong weapons down gloves up yeah Okay, Bab, I think I got that right. Um, yeah, and I, I think it's important. You know, I've been, you know, I've been stabbed. You know, I've been slashed. I've had, um, I've had all that put onto me, subjected to all that kind of stuff. Why do you feel it's important? Um, and what do you hope to achieve from this campaign? Um, well, I don't think the youngsters realise you're not just plunging someone with a knife and that's it. If you hit an archery, that's it. They're gone. They're dead. Mm. I said, that person, obviously, his mum and dad has lost someone. I said, then you, for doing that, you're going to end up in prison for life. I don't think the children of today and the teenagers realise how dangerous a knife can be. And then if you don't die, you could be scarred up for life. I mean, is it really worth it? The, the, the bigger person is the one that walks away. Yeah, I've always said that. Yeah, yeah. just but... walk away. You know, like I said before, you'll always get people that thrive on negativity. All you got to do is just look at them and walk away. Count to ten and walk away. And they're the ones stuck with their jaw in the floor because you've not retaliated. And it's took me a long time to work that out in my head. Like I said, I still make mistakes. But please listen with the, with the, with the knives. It's not a good thing. The only thing that will get you killed is your ego. Exactly. And your pride. Exactly. Now, I've... I, I had I, there was a time when I was I was fronted by this kid with a big blade, and um, I was running back and forth with him, and I was thinking, I put the knife down, and I was straightening it. Now I did get stabbed. Simple, you yeah. know. You had a knife. I brought fists to a knife fight, basically. Really, it's like bringing a knife and knife to a gunfight, isn't it? Yeah. Um, <laughs> and he stabbed me, and he got off, and that was it. Now I was lucky that I had pardon. I had like a, a hoodie on and I had a big chest by the way so <laughs> it didn't go right through uh, at the time but yeah um, it could have ended another way what is that well it's like in my book again let's just move it I swear at the end of the table yeah <laughs> um, in my book also um, there's a story where I got jumped as a teenager by two people obviously heroin addicts so um, I was looking them up and down because I've been brought up, always check them up and down looking for a blade. So my dad said, always because they want to cut your face to pieces. But um, anyway, I don't want to say too much about that because um, mm. that is also in the book. But luckily enough, they didn't have a blade. But if they did and they was obviously um, drugged up, they would have probably cut all my face and scarred me up. So, you know, mm. this is why you've got to realise that... Desperate. Need, yeah, yeah. Desperate. yeah, people are desperate. Yeah, you know they, I mean? you know... You, and a lot of them are drug addicts because they mm. want a fix and yeah. they're going to try yeah. and get money off you don't give it to them they're going to stab you so you just need to walk away just do not get involved in a situation in in in, in something that's going to put you in a situation basically yeah. what was your dad's uh, thoughts on drugs no he's, he's dead against drugs and um and obviously weapons he didn't, he didn't agree with any of it at all I don't, he's, he's not, he wouldn't have had the right frame of mind anyway mm. to have took drugs or anything like that. It's, I don't know if it's that chemical imbalance. I think if he ever did take anything, it'd probably go off his head, you know? Mm. So he was, but he was just dead against it. He just weren't into drugs whatsoever. The ale was enough. Yeah, that was, yeah. <laughs> that was enough to turn him. I'll tell anything else and then you Even dad's were Christmas pudding. I know they say when you cook something, the alcohol disappears in it, but yeah. my mum still wouldn't go for that just in case yeah. it left a little trace in it. I, I can't. <laughs> I, I, I say, I said this to, um, to a friend, I just can't. Like you uh, successfully, I can't have a drink. Why can't you drink? And I'll say I can't, right, uh, because for me, 
it's a gateway to other uh, other drugs, right. and that's what becomes. And yeah. I don't stop. And, I, and like yourself, where you've been, uh, you do say, know when people obviously in cer- cer- certain times people take drugs because they take it. But mm-hmm. like what I'm gathering from you is you probably self medicated where you probably should have gone to the doctor and got the right medication. If your brain weren't right, people self medicate with I normal think, drugs. Yeah, I think she like probably different similar 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 ways of growing up, you know, different circumstances and different different situations. But for me it was here uh, to, to suppress uh, the trauma that I was experienced. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. You were self medicating. Yeah. Well, if you probably would have gone to the doctors, you would have got something like um like with me i'm on mood stabilizers so it yeah. keeps my level there i'm not up or down i don't think it was anything to do with the mood i think it was then something to do with the the, the insecurities and, and the way i felt you know where uh, i didn't feel as if uh, i was a part of my own family right yeah, I, I felt family. yeah i felt i felt rejected all the time i felt dismissed um and it was quite sad so you know, i found i found company within drugs um I, well it wasn't the drugs it was the it was the the peers, and oh. then it led to drugs because to fit in. Then you yeah. take that, and then they you're welcomed into their circle. And then for me, I realised that I had like I didn't realise. I just only it was only later on, like yourself. It yeah. was years later that I had an addictive personality. Like one was too many, and a thousand was never enough. Um, yeah. And and I, I was always it stops working. Yeah, and you're taking more. It was always something. To, I was always chasing the next one. Yeah, and it was something different. And then it was it become from 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 the sh- from the class B's to the class A's, right. the class A's to prison to institutions to reading books about your dad and Charlie Bronson and Pretty yeah. Boy Shore and you know learning. And and I, I've got to say this: sometimes when you read like these books in a prison and young lads, you know when they read, they're they're, they're quite impressionable. Yeah, you know when um, I wanted to be Charlie Bronson and get on the roof <laughs> because he was yeah. Oh, fuck, yeah. So we did. I climbed yeah. on a prison roof, and I've 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 reached that goal. Yeah. You know, you want to be pretty boy sure and Ben Shell George, but I don't think that's possible. Like, but some people could. You know what I yeah. mean? And knocking all kinds of screws out. You know, did you ever go and see your dad fight? Any 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 of his fights? Did you ever go and watch any? No, I was always too young. My brother went to one. One that was. Um... Um, was organised because this fight was um, if my dad won which he did obviously yeah. he bought um, obviously yes, <laughs> he bought a minibus for um, like disabled children yeah. and that, so that one was like a do with a dinner and dance and my brother went to that but no I've actually seen my dad yeah fight but not in the ring did he did he do a lot of charity your dad yeah, he did. did yeah, you? like I do. I, yeah. I, you know, I, I, I give um a lot of my books. I sign them and I give them to Tony, and he'll raise money for charity, whichever one he's doing at the time. You know, but yeah, my dad definitely, you know, he'd give you anything. You know, he was like that. People didn't realise that side of him. He did have a genuine art. You know. Yeah. I mean, I can remember a girl falling over like in front of him. She was only about six. He gave her twenty pound. He went, "I can't see a cry. I'll take that. <laughs> we'll go and buy some sweets." Mm. You know, he can't bear anyone, any child, like being upset, and that probably stems from his upbringing as well. Because yeah. I'm the same. Not, not that I didn't have a bad upbringing. I had quite like you know, I would. It wasn't great. It wasn't bad, it weren't good, but I wouldn't change it for the world. It was definitely different yeah. to everyone else's and it was fun, you know. You always like my dad just come and throw money up in the air. It was like one of the movies, you know, it comes out all slow <laughs> and you catch it all, like, all under the pillar. But yeah. then when he woke up next morning and remembered, didn't they want it back? <laughs> <laughs> but he said, he said, Val, where's my money? She say, Ask the effing kids. Yeah. It'll be under our pillars. <laughs> yeah, that didn't last much longer. But, yeah, you know, but like I say, you know, every upbringing is different and it, and it's your story to tell. And this is my story that's in this book to tell. And I hope people buy it and read it. And I hope, um, you know, it helps them in some way, like my dad's book helped others. That's what I want to achieve. Yeah, that's that, no, that, and that, I think that's the reason, she. When I, you know, you're never going to make money from a book. You know as well as me, Kelly. It's not a, it's not a money spinner. No, you know, definitely you, so not, no. for those that think, oh, you wrote, you, you write a book and you, you, you become, you're loaded. You're not. No. You know, I've written, I've written two. Yeah. You know what I mean? And I'm still skint. <laughs> right. They've made a, they've made a movie about me, and I'm still skint. You know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. What's going 
on. It's, it's wrong here, isn't it? Yeah, so the, <laughs> I think, hang on, I'm probably, you know, there's people get working, right, honestly, it's just, it is, it, it's not what you think, right, yeah. so the reality is you're writing a story, right, and you're sharing it, Yeah. and for me, and I, I, I don't know whether this is for you, but I, I feel like I could be on the right path here, it's more of a cathartic way of like healing as well. Yeah, a lot of therapeutic. Yeah, right? it yeah, was very, oh, it was, see, both of them, both of the books that I've written have both been therapeutic yeah. for me. Both of the books that I've written have both been written in prison, by the way. Right. It's funny because yeah. when Tony organised it, or not Tony Turner organised this um, podcast, and when he said "Pray Before Dawn," it was funny because only a couple of months ago, me and my husband watched it. What did you think of it? Shit. Yeah. <laughs> not really. I'll Sorry it about that. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was good. No, yeah, no, you wouldn't have watched it. No, do you know what? It was really good, actually. I really liked it. They're the sort of films I like watching. Yeah, because and off, off. Um, off sort of the scene and that I did ask you if certain things happened in it and you said yeah it was 95% the truth well do you know I had an interview yesterday right um, with, with a guy who was away with in uh, the same prison yeah we spent three years together and it was like it was like it was really nice to actually sit there and this was like over a decade since yeah. I've seen him so you can imagine Kelly we, we were both in in, um, in the same city in Thailand together prior to getting arrested yeah. we were doing like things that we shouldn't have been doing, getting to no good, yeah. you know, schools ugly, and we ended up uh, both in the same prison. He followed me, I went first. So we was on the path of my experience all the way through. Right, yeah. Right. Is so that the first time you seen him again? That was the first time I seen him, and he's, he was up these ways, Essex, and uh, we spent over an hour yesterday talking about it, and it was just, it was like great to be in conversation. Yeah. Um, and how's he doing from it all? Has his experience changed his life? She... Yeah, his, his expe- yeah, he still has nightmares and night terrors and he, he finds it really difficult. Where, for him, he'd never been to prison, right. ever. He was like, you know, he, he, he was married, he had kids, it, it went tits up and, you know, he ended up uh, in, in Thailand thinking, you know, chasing dreams that were lost and found himself in prison. So he struggled massively. Where, for me, I'd been, into, been to prison in the UK right. yeah. like, for years. So it was like it was something like going from one place to another. It's just adapting to yeah. a different situation, you know. But remaining like, like really like vigilant mentally, yeah. where he, he struggles and he talks about that openly, which was uh, But yeah, it was, it was, it was, it was good to actually. After, it was that was therapeutic as well. Yeah. To hear him talk about his experience from his per- perception. Yeah. And his view of it, and my observations of him. So yeah, I mean, this is a uh, so is it really has it helped you to write this? Oh yeah, definitely. I mean, um, it was funny because I did start writing it and I thought I had a book. <laughs> when I typed it up, like there was seven thousand words. Then I thought it was a book. I thought, yeah. oh my god, this is a book. You don't realise here what's no. going. And then I think I've declared I'm writing a book. I've got to do this. Yeah, yeah. And then obviously me and my husband went over each sentence and added like 200, 300 words just to one sentence. And then we got it up to like. So did you write this yourself? Yeah. Well done. Do you yeah. know what? It's um, I, I I I like the fact that people. I've read their own yeah. story. Don't get me wrong, I had someone yeah. do the grammar, Lee Wortley. Obviously. I had him do the grammar in it for me, and all the grammar. Shame, you need you need yeah. someone to, do, to proofread it. No, I might have said me and my brother went but, to the shop, he'll say me and my brother and I. So yeah. he's, he's, the literacy is being changed a little bit, yeah. and that's, that's, that's important. But actually, that's, read it, it's all, in that book, it's all my memory. I have yeah. not asked friends or relatives about any. That is all from my memory. So tell me this then, Kelly, because I, I want to wanna just uh, learn something from yourself. Uh, how did you feel writing it yourself? You know, like, so for me, when I wrote mine, it was like I couldn't escape the truth. I, could, I, I didn't dictate and get someone to write it and start telling, you know, inventing stories. I knew when I put the yeah. words on paper that it was real. Yeah. And and, and I, I became really emotional around a few things and yeah, it was I mean, bringing I, stuff up. The the hardest part of writing, believe it or not, that book, I've got the death of my dad, the death of my mum. Um, I tried to commit suicide. Some other stuff that I've done to myself. And um, the hardest part was about my children mm. because um, 
I, I self-armed when they sorry I'm gonna get most I self-armed when they me, needed me the most mm. and that is the that is that was the hardest part to write of that book out of everything was my children because they needed me more than anything and I was I was self-arming I needed away you know and that's where my husband Scott stepped in you know bless him and he's a medal mm. living with someone like me and yet he still loves me yeah. you know I don't know how he can look at me in that way what I've put him through but it ain't my fault that's my makeup that's just the way I went you know um but yeah that was the hardest part of writing the book having to sort of let my girls down I know people say right it's selfish to even to, to do something like that to yourself or even think about ending your own life when you've got family and kids yeah I did when I tried to commit suicide I didn't have the kids yeah but with the self-arming they was they was babies yeah but you had to be right and this is how it is you have to be out of your mind right not in your right mind so to speak to be even doing that stuff so yeah. you're not you're collectively you're not mentally like equipped yeah well, cold. I wasn't diagnosed no. with this bipolar. I wasn't on any tablets to help with my mood, so they were going up and down. I would literally put the kids to bed, and it's funny, since that toilet out there, I would go in there, there's a mirror in there, and I would stand there from 8 o'clock. But I, I blank out, I didn't know. And then I'm there till 8 o'clock the next morning. Now, I know I've done damage because I've been there all them hours, and then there'd be blood everywhere, all in my fingernails, all in the sink. Well, I've just picked myself to pieces. You know, and then now I've got like an hour now to cover it up before the girls get up. There's no way I'm covering that up. It's weeping. Mm. You know, they've got to stick talcum powder on it. There's, 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 there's certain things that, you know, you try and cover up and it's just weeping through. They've got to take them to school late so none of the parents see me. It, it, it was just chaos. My head was chaos. You know, and and I've even put the... Because <laughs> my... my um, the the person at John Blake's office, they said to me, "You sure you want to put this certain bit in?" Because um, my husband tried to strangle me, mm. but I said, "Yeah," because I can't blame him. If I could strang, if I had the guts to strangle myself, I would have probably strangled myself. What I put him through, and what I put the children through, you know. But obviously, mentally, my head weren't there properly. I mean, two hours before getting on the plane, I've picked myself to pieces, and my husband now's got to look at me on that plane while my skin's just weeping. And he just lost it, you know, and he tried to strangle me. But he is not a violent person. And they said to me, you sure you want to put that in? I said, yeah, because he's not a violent person. He's placid. I mean, he's a big bloke, mm. but he's placid. But I pushed him to that. And if I was in his, in his position, I probably would have strangled me, you know? Yeah, and it's, it's, it's understandable. It's, the, it's a point where you just, you just lose control, you yeah. know, and, and the mist comes in. Well, yeah, I could yeah. see the mist. Don't worry about that. <laughs> it was getting darker and darker. <laughs> you know, but I didn't fight back because yeah. I just thought, you know, am I better off if I weren't here for everyone else? But no, now I want to live. I actually want to live. But you understand now that, like, like mental health uh, can cause, like, like really serious conflict and problems within families. Can't. You yeah. know, and it's, 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 it needs to be sort of addressed as a whole, as a unit, as yeah. a family unit. Well, I, I, I've always had this um, attitude, this terrible attitude. Mm. Oh, they're no good, they're a drunk, they're a drug addict. It's a bad attitude to have because this is what pushes them sort of people further into their addiction. Yeah. Instead of looking at them and thinking, why are they like this and try and help them, you know, and then, then you perhaps can guide them in the right way instead of judging them. And this is what I do now. Don't judge people. Some, there is always a reason why people do something. So stop and think before you judge them. Because I've had people point at me. I still get it now. You know? Mm. But is, there's a reason why. There was a reason why I was self-harming. It's because of the abuse. But I never admitted it. Mm. It was the loss of both of my parents when I needed them the most. You know? So please sit back. Don't judge people things they do mm. I mean my abuser died this year and um, I didn't know how to take that uh, I, and I cried because that situation now God's took away from me I knew where that person was so if I ever wanted to approach her and ask her why she did it I could I can't now mm. so that decision's been took from me and it took me a good couple of weeks to cope with that I know it sounds mad but I, I, I just, but that's it now. I can never question that. No, it doesn't sound mad at all. I, I mean, if that was something that had happened to me and I knew where 
the abuser was, I'd, and I'd, I'd grown up to be a big yeah. lump of a man who'd gone through a load of shit yeah. the, way, the way I did. There'd be nothing down for him or her. You know what yeah. I mean? It, it'd just be... And to find out that they've, they've, they've passed away, that you just the powerlessness. Yeah, it was just. Weird. There's like there's no there's no writing. answers. Yeah. There's no answers, and there's no satisfaction. And and I know there's people out there going, yeah, well, you know, let's forgive. You know, and maybe that's for them. It, it'll work. You know, I'll the forgive. Only, them. Yeah. The only thing I think that obviously there was questions I might have wanted to ask, mm. but I think the, the main question I wanted to know I got. Because I researched all her family afterwards. Like I wanted to see her, where her kids, like what they were like. I mm. never would have said anything because she may never have done it again. And I didn't want her children to look at her in the way that I looked at her. Mm. I've got kids myself. People might think, well, so what? But that's just the way I am. Um, when I researched her kids, the posts that they put up about their mum, their daughter. So at least I got closure in that. I know mm. that she never touched her own children. So for me, that's one part that I'm happy with, you know, because that mm. always played on my mind because I never said anything, did she, in the fear of her own kids. And then you've got to look, and, and I know it's, 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 it might sound crazy, but then you've got to look what's been going on for there to actually do that. Well, exactly. Then yeah. I'm thinking, was she abused by you know, yeah. her dad, her stepdad? Was she abused? And it's just like, it's good that you can think that way. I mean, it's, it's fucking crazy, like, isn't it? But yeah. yeah. You know, and you got that little bit of closure with um, the fact that a, a, a child's on a daughter, you know. and uh, Exactly, and they adored her. What they put up, they absolutely adored her, you know. So, you know, for me... But did you ever have, though, girl, that, that, like, I'm fucking going down here and I am going to smash your head in? <laughs> Do you know what? It was it was weird because I blanked it out all my life. I've yeah. got to be honest, um, a, a situation like... Um, sort of like appeared and it, it woke somebody up in my brain you know it was something someone did oh god about four years ago and then all of a sudden something clicked and then i remembered i think i put it at the you know when you put that something at the back of your head and yeah. it's, sort of, it's like a black spot and you can't think what it is yeah and then someone did something and it woke it up like that and then that was it it was all fresh Triggers. every minute the minute yeah. the way that she did it what she played what she done and how old was you back then you about mean? five wow well i mean just a, a vulnerable child yeah what i mean you know, so. and, I, and i remember as a child having this same occurring dream dream every night and it obviously was i was trapped in this dream i was trapped no matter what way i was it was like a little room and i was either too big for the room or the room was massive and I was too little. It was exactly mm. the same dream every night. One like one of them two every single night. But I suppose it's because I'm trapped, you know, she's gonna get me. Yeah. I suppose when you look at it like that. It's fear. Yeah. yeah. I never worked them dreams out until later in life. Just yes. thought it was a bit like um oh God, Alice in Wonderland. You know when she's in there and she's too small for the door? Yeah. Or she's too big for it, she can't fit for it. It was exactly like that dream. But I suppose now, as I've got older, I've worked out what it meant. It meant that I was trapped. Yeah. So you've had some uh, counselling, have you, around that? Yeah. Or some therapy? Ah, uh, I did have therapy, but I didn't declare any of that. Because mm. if, I think, for legal reasons, if she's still alive, they have to report it. Yeah. And I didn't want them to do that because she had children. So I never spoke about that. But now she's passed, I might go back in therapy it's, it's, now. It's crazy, though, the way you, you can feel, like she can get away with something like that as well. Yes, because, yeah. Because, you know, at the same time, you're not thinking of her, you're thinking of her kids. Yeah. Which is selfless in your on your behalf, which, yeah. you know, you're like, okay, so this is what's going to go. Yeah. Sits up. But yeah, you know, it's... It's it's it's, well, it's, it's just, a difficult situation yeah. for you, isn't it? Really. Well, the damage is done to me. It's done. It was years ago, wasn't mm. it? I don't. I didn't want her children. To, she's dead. I don't want her children to look at her in that way. Yeah. I want them to remember that their mum, like her, that her, I remember my mum. You know, mm. a nice woman, which my mum was. You know, but I wanted them to look at their mum. Yeah. And think of it like that. I didn't want them to look at her the way I look at her. Well, and like you said, it'll never go away. But you think you've addressed it now. Do you think you can, Definitely. You, you can I mean, live? I can, I can, like, you're a man and I can talk to you yeah. about it where I would never have mentioned it before ever in a million years, but because I've put it in my book, yeah. I can actually talk about it now. And like, like I say, I tried to take my own life, I can talk about that. Yeah, it's important. I, I agree because for years I couldn't uh, speak up about, you know, how I felt 
about my dad. Yeah. I never did. I'd I break down. And I used to wake up, you know, of a night crying, sobbing. Next to girlfriends that, you know, would come and go because of the way I was anyway. Yeah. And they'd be confused. And, you know, I couldn't even explain to them. And it was, it was strange. And I was only young. I think because we're young and we're conditioned at that very, very early age to uh, believe in heroes or, 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 or people that are taking care of us. Yeah. And then some don't. You know, it affects us going through life. And that's where we talk about, like, you know, the drug addicts. You know, what's the contributing factors that led them well, exactly, yeah, to, that. To, to go down on that road of, like, injecting drugs and smoking yeah. crack and, well, it's you like know... homeless uh, children, isn't it? Yeah. They're only out there because they're being abused at home, probably, or mm. being beat groomed. up at home. Yeah. You know what I mean? And, and groomed and things like that. You know, like if I stop and see, I always give them. So I'll go and buy them something to eat, and then go back and give it to them. Because yeah. you don't know if some of them are down there. They're rich people back in that there. I've had it before. You know, they're sitting there and they want money, and then when they go around the corner, all that comes off, and they've got lo- they're loaded. Yeah, no, I've seen a few. <laughs> I might try that. Out. <laughs> I've seen a few of these. Yeah, these black homeless. Yeah, like, but I normally buzz. go and get them something to eat, and then I go and I give it to them. You get the bus into town. Yeah. You're sleeping back, <laughs> and then and then you go back to the flat at the end of the day. <laughs> You know, a little blanket out there, a little card. Like we said, this ain't made us millions. That yeah, might. Yeah, yeah, that <laughs> might. But like, it, it is, it's like, it's ways and means to, to get what you need. You know, we're living in a world of like, you know, if you want something, you're going to get it. Yeah. You know, no matter what you do, you know, yeah. you're going to go through brick walls, you're going to harm people. The thing is, if you want something, you've got to work hard. Yeah. You know, I've got three jobs and I work hard. You know, but on all three of my jobs, I work hard. How do you, you manage three jobs? Oh, I love it. I love that. I couldn't be in here all day long. The three parts got to be three part time jobs. Right? <laughs> well, they're all in the same building, so they're two different, fi- all different uh, things. I work in a school, so but it's obviously it's, it's still with. But then I get time off. Look, I'm off free stuff. Yeah. So you work every six weeks. You're off on term time. Brilliant. But I love it. I ain't got. I ain't even got time to say hello to anyone in Monday to Friday because I do these jobs. I've got this new dog. So I'm quite busy. So mentally, that's good. Yeah, and now, and I and that's uh, that's important. So I think you need routine, yeah. uh, discipline. Because I don't like I do. I I'm an only person. Yeah. Like, as soon as I go to work, I'm straight in. Pajamas yeah. on, air tied up, and I'm indoors. That's it. Yeah. I love being home. And uh, for the likes of you know, it, it, it it's it's me mate said this to me years ago, and it's always stuck with me. He says you need to get busy living, or you get busy dying. Right. Yeah. And I thought, well, okay, because the minute you stop. It opens the back door and your mind's exactly. Then it full. starts playing tricks. Then yeah, it? it's it's bickering, it's it, it's contradicting, it's it's yeah. condescending, it's putting you down, it's telling you that it's shit, it's not worth it. Why don't you go and fucking use? Why don't you go and fucking do something stupid to yourself? And the more you, that self negative talk, because you allow it to come in, yeah. You know, and I've had people say, well, you know, change that voice in your head, you know, saying it, and it's it's it, it is difficult, but for me, you know. I, I don't feel depressed. I don't. I've got no time. No more. That's it. No. I've got. I'm like yourself. I'm busy. But when I do come home, I like to chill out. Yeah. You know, I've got all the creature comforts. I think it's important to have a nice, comfortable bed. You know <laughs> yeah, what I mean? I love bed, yeah. yeah. I love my bed. <laughs> you know, and there's something to watch. You'll or, or just chill out and wind down, and then you're back at it the next day. And you know, I think I'm the same age as yourself, Kelly. I don't know how you feel, but. You know, it's the older we get, the, the more we feel it. You know well, what I mean? Well, my mum always said that. My mum always looked well for her age. And she said, she said, you say I might look well, she said, but I feel 50 inside. Mm. I've got to honestly say, hand on heart, I yeah. feel about 18 inside. Oh, you're blessed. Do you know, you know I, I work with children, <laughs> honestly, the yeah. teacher come out, I'm, doing, I'm 49 this year, I'm doing cartwheels into the splits, I'm doing backflips, I'm doing the, the worm on the floor, you know, the caterpillar. Yeah. I'm playing football with the boys yeah, and yeah. the teachers when I welcome to why the kids love you. Yeah. I, ju- I, I can do anything. One hand cartwheels. I just, I keep myself fit and do all stuff like yeah. that. I, I've got to honestly say, I do feel quite young inside. Yeah. I think you want to swap bodies. I think I've, <laughs> I think I've done a, too much damage with boxing and yeah. weightlifting. I don't think and, you're not that well though. We have your head on my body. <laughs> 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 yeah. But yeah, no, I feel quite good actually inside. I, I'm, I love life at the moment, and I hope it stays like that. No, and that's it's nice. Um, okay, so what's what's what is it that's going on at the moment? So we've gone through a bit of your life. We talked about your dad. Um, we talked about your book, and 
Well, hopefully this year I want to promote my book a bit more. Obviously, last year we had the lockdown. It sort of put it on hold. I'm hoping to do, um, I think it's called the, I don't know what it's called, probably the Gangster Bus yes. that takes you all around. So I'm hoping that Tony's going to organise that. Um, the next podcast coming up is with um, James English. Mm. So I'm looking forward to doing that one as well. Also, if anyone wants to know anything different about my dad, this book is the old truth and nothing but the truth. And there is no, nothing told in this book that's in my mum or dad's book. It's all fresh stories. Yeah. And there is also two stories in there that no one knows about, only a certain handful of people. And it's about my dad. So you need to get this. Well, I, think I'll, I think I'll share, you know, later <laughs> on with it. I guess you know. I, I you know what? I haven't even read my own. Yeah, I, no. right. I've read this about eight times. <laughs> I don't. I can't even read. I can't read. Right. I don't like. It's it's it's, it's crazy. Like, I mean, when I get into the the the, the role of it, I, I I can enjoy reading, especially when you're in prison. You can read all day long. Yeah. You know what I mean? But when you're out here, it's like finding the time. And you know, I'm. You know, you talked about it before. Patience. You don't. You jump the cues and stuff like yeah. that. I've got that. Um, that that. That impatience and intolerance. Yeah. You know, and I know I know I'm aware of it. I'm aware of it. So like we, petrol garages. I hate, ah. putting, I hate putting petrol in. It's boring, isn't it? Or oh, paying for a fucking set of beans <laughs> with your bank card. You know what I mean? I can't stand so. queuing up, paying, putting petrol in my car. Just they're just unnecessary things, mm. really. But obviously, we need to do it. We need to do it. Yeah. So how do you get to get all like? Hot and bothered and react. Yeah, I'm fidgeting. And the person in front's getting really aggravated with me because then I'm moving too close to them. <laughs> and then I'm back. Then Ladies, I'm forward. Yeah. <laughs> Six foot apart. <laughs> I'm moving back and forth. There's no two meters a piece of there, yeah. is there? <laughs> and then I'm fiddling about with my hair. I'm itching. I'm doing this, doing that. I don't know what to do next. But they can see I'm getting aggravated. Yeah. And I think then, then they're more slower in front because they know it's aggravating me more. <laughs> But you know, you've got to learn. I've got patience of a saint with all the kids. Everything, yeah. love it. So, how's family life now? Is uh, is that is that is that gone better over the years? Yeah, I mean, it's better now that obviously, like I said, I have written the book. It, yeah. Like you say, we never earned no money out of the books, but it was therapeutic and it got mm. a lot off my chest. And um, yeah, and obviously, even though I've been with my partner a long time, he didn't know like some of the stuff yeah. I never told him and my best mate Karen Latimer she's been friends with me since I've been eight and she yeah. never knew about the abuse you know it broke her heart when I told her because I just kept everything a secret until I started writing the book mm, brilliant it's exciting uh, okay Kel we're coming to the end of yeah, uh, the okay. podcast it's been really amazing to talk to you uh, I always ask is there any like pearls of wisdom that you could share with the guests anything you'd say to a young Kelly McLean the governor's daughter. Don't back. No, don't. <laughs> um, whatever you want to achieve in life, there's no such word as I can't. You can. And you follow through whatever you want to do. And at the end of it, you'll be very successful and you'll be proud of yourself. Stand tall and look in the mirror. You can do whatever you want. Never, ever give up on your dreams. Also, if you would like to follow me on Facebook, it is the official Lenny McLean site run by Lenny McLean's only daughter, me. Please join if you want to see and hear or um, all different news stories about my dad. Yeah. I'll put all your socials on the um, on the link to your book. Oh, thank you very much. Um, Can I just say hello to my children? Yeah, go on. So I just want to say hello to my beautiful two children, Prudence and Ruby, and two little children special in my life, Joshua and Chloe. Um, and a big hello to my friend Karen Latimer. Sorry, Karen, who's got a crush on you. <laughs> <laughs> She wanted to come to down by your footstool. <laughs> Where are you? <laughs> well, she's just going on a serious diet for the next podcast. <laughs> she's going to kill me now. And I'm with that one. Nice one. Right. Okay, thank you very much. It's been thank a great you. podcast. Thank you.